perfect. Hello, Shalom. Oh, hello, Phyllis. How are you? <laughs> oh, fine, Tess. How are you? I am great. I'm great. Thank you so much. Welcome to both of you. Welcome both Shalom and Phyllis Antis, our amazing guest who is going to be teaching us about pathogens. I have to tell you, I read both books, Tainted and Toxic, and you know that because I reached out to you. And um, I was scared of eating before reading these books. Now, <laughs> it's just a whole different world. And I and uh, like today, I went food shopping before our meeting. And usually, I go to the farmers market in New York City, and I went to Trader Joe's. I know you're in uh, you're in uh, you're in Western Canada, correct? Correct in Victoria. Right. So um, I don't know if you have Trader Joe's there. We have a place called Trader Joe's. It's a popular uh, supermarket in New York. And um, I it well. We lived in California for quite a few years and used to frequent it. So you know it. And every week that I go, there are pictures of foods that have been recalled at the cash register. And I pay attention, but Today, I saw two things that I bought in the past, and I was like, God, why were they recalled? One was for rocks yes. and sand, and the other one was for, um, I think there was a pathogen. I read it really fast, and I just wanted to close my eyes and run away. How the hell do you get rocks and food well, in the manufacturing process? I guess it happens. Um, I remember when uh, I first started working in food safety, um, I was living in uh, Winnipeg and my parents were living in Montreal. And I used to tell my mother all of the horror stories because I was working for the Canadian government at that point in what was then the equivalent to Canada's FDA. Uh, and I was regaling my mother with all of these scare stories and these problems. And she said to me, you know, for the first time, I'm happy you're not living here in Montreal with me. Otherwise I would never eat anything. I really want to talk about toxic since this podcast is about the pet industry. Yes. I really want to hit on that. And you have Shalom who is, who inspired you to write this book. Is that correct? That is correct. Actually, so, when we started uh, when we started talking about what to feed her and there were all of these recalls and issues going on at the time she's uh, seven and a half years old so this was around uh, 20 early 2016 when when she arrived on our doorstep and uh, we decided that we were going to feed her a home prepared diet and my husband and I were walking with her on the beach in Carmel, where we lived at the time. Beautiful place to live, especially with a dog. And uh, I was telling him some of the recent stories. And I said, you know, I really should write a book about this. And he said, go for it. And I went for it. <laughs> So it's it's been a it's been a long project. It actually was about a five year long project from the time we first talked about it, and it wasn't a one hundred percent activity for five years because in the interim I uh, got back the copyright to my first food safety book that I had written for um, the American Society for Microbiology. And uh, when they went out of the publishing business, uh, they returned copyright to me and I revised an updated book and that became Tainted. So that happened in the interim. And I also got my last mystery in, in the interim. So it's been, a, it's been a slow process, but about a year or so ago, I looked at where I was at and I said to myself, it's time, I've got to finish this thing. <laughs> So we, we uh, had a, a few back and forth emails and some conversation about this. And you mentioned that um, something about the dog's stomach pH. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and I had never thought of this as being a, um, 
God, how did you put it? A myth? A myth. So, um, I, I, um, after we talked about that, I went back in because I have seen comments uh, on a lot of sites, mainly people talking about uh, whether or not salmonella is an issue or a problem for dogs. And the general comment is, well, the pH of the stomach in a dog is so acidic, it's going to kill the salmonella off anyway, unlike a human. Well, fact of the matter is the gastric pH of a dog, a dog's stomach, uh, according to the literature that I went back and double checked, and again, this will vary from study to study, is anywhere from around 1.4 to 2.7, with the lowest number being the most acid. Uh, gastric pH in humans is generally around 1.5 to 2. So there's really no difference in the stomach pH overall between humans and dogs. Uh, the difference, such as there is, is how long the food stays in the stomach before carrying on to the small intestine. And that time tends to be longer in dogs than it is in humans. It tends to be longer? Yes. Uh, and again, this, this varies all over the place, but the general tendency is, um, if, I, if I remember my physiology correctly, this is not my primary uh, target of information, but uh, generally humans have a longer small intestine mm -hmm. relative to their size and weight than dogs do. Right. So in humans, um, the digestion uh, occurs to a greater extent in the small intestine than in the dogs. The dogs, the food resides longer in the stomach and there's a shorter small intestine, so it doesn't reside as long in the small intestine. Fact of the matter is stomach pH is not really relevant to the question of pathogen survival or any bacteria survival. Um, bacteria, including things like probiotics that get through the system into the large intestine, all pass through that same acidic pH. Um, food itself can have a protective effect on the bacteria. So if you've got a fattier food or food where there's protein that just sort of moderates the the contact some that can serve to help protect the bacteria from the stomach's acidity that was one myth i wanted to debunk because i've seen it so often with regard to raw pet foods and why salmonella isn't an issue for dogs versus humans and oh, I, I don't understand what that has to do with them shedding the salmonella. I mean, it may not impact them, right? If, if we, I guess if I, if I was to believe that myth, um, I would still question, isn't this, isn't there a possibility of this dog shedding salmonella in his feces? So how is that relevant? Uh, the, the way, the way I've seen that uh, myth used is, well, you don't have to worry about salmonella infecting a dog because the salmonella get killed by the stomach acid and never make it to the point of infecting the dog. Okay. And that in itself is, is a myth because salmonella can infect dogs. Some of them will show symptoms. Some of them will not. And... If the dog is infected, it can shed the salmonella in its feces, whether or not it's showing symptoms. Okay. So at that point, it's a problem with the human. If the animal's shedding salmonella in its feces, the human can actually be impacted. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Because um, as any pet lover knows dogs lick themselves in all sorts of appropriate and inappropriate places and then lick their human companions, especially children. Okay. Don't know enough to wash their hands or 
otherwise avoid getting the bug themselves. Okay, so let's let's kind of move from this into um, because we're talking about raw food at this very moment, right? These these conversations about the dog's gut pH are mostly on the raw food platforms, I assume, because yes. protecting the integrity of raw foods. That's where I've seen them. What about uh, contaminated kibble? And we we just don't address that enough. I mean, and and I think this is something else I'd brought up to you as well. In the last five to 10 years, is there any documentation to show if, you know, we can trace back the number of deaths or, or um, reactions to pets that consume raw foods contaminated with salmonella or any other pathogens versus kibble? Is that something you can touch on? Uh, I wish I could. Bottom line is, as, as FDA loves to say from time to time, there is no CDC for animals. There is no agency to which animal illnesses from, from pathogens is reported. Uh, there is no mandatory reporting of animal illnesses to FDA or any other agency. Um, the FDA has a portal through which veterinarians can voluntarily report illnesses. And the FDA also encourages consumers to contact them directly if they think a pet food has caused an illness. But there's no mandatory reporting. Even if a veterinarian uh, runs an actual fecal test for salmonella, which is very unusual for a veterinarian to do anyway, even if the test is run and the test comes back positive, there's no mandatory reporting. So in the absence of mandatory reporting, there are no reliable data. Is there any data? Uh, in the last five to 10 years, very little. Uh, there were reports of um, pet associated illnesses, if I remember correctly, back uh, with the Mars Pet Care kibble outbreak and the Diamond Pet Foods uh, kibble salmonella outbreak. The only reason those got the attention they did is that both of those contaminated kibble product groups caused human illness. And in the process of uh, the CDC following up on the human illness and tracking its source epidemiologically to pet food, the FDA got involved with the pet food investigation and received, because of consumer awareness at that point, received some reports and complaints some of which included pet illness mention, but there was no specific, no real documentation that you can, that you can put your finger on and say, uh, this percentage of dogs who were exposed became ill, or this percentage of households with pets saw a pet illness, or this was the proportion of pet illness in dry foods to, to raw food, they just don't exist. Is the public too trusting of the food companies? Do they really, especially veterinarians? Our veterinarians see the problems. Short answer is yes. Um, the consumers are too trusting, not just of big uh, companies, but in some ways are even more trusting of the small companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they figure, okay, these are not the big guys. These are the little guys like me. These are the ones I can trust. Right. Uh, but it's not the size of the company that determines whether or not it is trustworthy. It is the attention of the company to quality control, quality assurance, pathogen control that determines whether or not a company is trustworthy. That's a... 
that's a big picture. And each company has to commit to being present and knowing what they're putting out there and being honest. Um, That said, I look at a couple of chapters in your book, one about Darwin's pet food, Yes. Um, the other about Answers Pet Food, Listen, LLC, and their, uh, I guess, I saw it as delay tactics with the FDA and getting around the possible problems with pathogens in their foods. Can you talk about the responsibility of the brands and what happens with the regulatory bodies when it comes to dealing with these companies? Let's start with the small ones, if you don't mind, because the big ones, I believe, have a more money than God too, and they can. <laughs> it's just it becomes a game. I just don't trust anybody. Okay. Um, first off, as far as the FDA is concerned, um, in principle anyway, whether a company is large, medium size, or small, whether a company produces kibble or canned food or raw food or cooked fresh pet food, it is the responsibility uh, of the company to ensure the safety of the product that they are selling. That's, that's the basic bottom line uh, that the FDA starts from. That said, uh, the FDA, when it is bringing in a new regulation, uh, and one example of this is when the Food Safety Modernization Act was implemented and the various regulations and directives relating to that start to be implemented. The FDA uh, tends to operate on the basis of, um, okay, here is regulation A, it might be regarding uh, the need to have a written food safety plan and HACCP plan uh, on the record. They will tend to say, they will tend to give graded deadlines. So because large companies have more resources, they will give them the shortest time in which to comply. Then the medium-sized company, and then they tend to cut the small companies some extra slack in how long they, how much time they have to comply with a new regulation, such as developing the food safety plan. Hmm. So if a regulation comes into effect at point X, say there was a new regulation coming into effect today. Um, large companies might be given six months to comply, medium-sized companies, 12 months, smallest companies, 18 months. So they, they tend to operate in stages that way in order to give the smaller companies that have fewer resources and fewer experts in-house more time to comply with a major new regulation. Okay. Um, this, of course, is directly opposite to what some people think and saying, okay, FDA is always picking on the little guy because they're easier to pick on. Exactly. That's- Thank you for saying it. I was just thinking that because that is what goes around in... The opposite of what... Yeah. Wow. And that's true, not just in the pet food area, that's also true with human food. Okay. So that a number of years ago, when a brand new egg safety regulation came in for uh, egg laying facilities, Mm -hmm. there was a graded uh, timeline for large, large producers had to comply the soonest, and then the smaller ones, and then the smallest ones. It's a fairly standard uh, procedure that FDA follows in the food and pet food areas in order to give the little guys some extra time to comply. In in, in the book uh, Tainted, you had mentioned there was a 
one of the little guys who basically tore apart human well-being with the way they were producing products. Um, was that with eggs or peanut butter? Oh, it was the peanut butter guy. Oh, peanut butter. oh eggs and peanut butter. Oh my God. Peanut, butter. peanut butter was particularly egregious because this company was knowingly shipping salmonella contaminated peanut butter. Knowingly. Knowingly. Yeah. But that goes to, on the pet side, with Darwin's. Yeah. So let's talk about that, how these companies um, use legal tactics to bypass accountability and what kind of impact that has on the public. Well, where do I begin? Let me, let me begin by talking about the FDA's usual process when Please. they go through a, an inspection. Uh, they will, up until the time of COVID, these inspections were all unannounced. So when FDA decided that it was time to inspect a company like Darwin's, they just turned up the door, handed a notice of inspection to the responsible individual. In the case of Darwin's, that would have been, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? The, the president of the company. Yeah, uh, I can't think of his name. You can look it up. It will, it will come up. It will come back to me. Anyhow, they, they hand a, a notice of inspection. They go in, they do their inspection. These inspections can be, can really range in terms of how in-depth they are. Sometimes they'll just take a day or two, do a walkthrough, especially if it's just something that they consider routine surveillance. They'll look for major things that pop up at them. Uh, some, if sometimes an inspection is a result of having received a series of complaints, in which case they'll have a more careful look at that particular aspect. So in the case of Darwin's, because the question of uh, listeria and salmonella in the Darwin's finished products came up, the inspection included environmental swab sampling and finished product sampling to look for the pathogens and determine the extent of the problem. At the end of the inspection, if everything is tickety-boo and there's no problems, mm -hmm. the inspection is graded as no action indicated. There's an inspection report written up. Of course, the company gets a copy of everything of the report. Uh, if there are uh, observations that the inspection makes, that the inspector makes that are in his or her determination, potential violations or potential problems, there's a meeting that happens at the close of the inspection with management, with company management, and all of those observations are reviewed what is a problem, why it's a problem, what should be done to correct the problem. These observations are listed in uh, an FDA form that is referred to as the Form 483 Inspectional Observations, where they're, where they're all summarized in a list that these are the things that need to be addressed. Uh, depending on the history with the company and the seriousness of the of the observations, an inspection might be uh, rated as voluntary action indicated, mm -hmm. in which case uh, the company management will have said, oh yeah, we will take care of all of these things. You know, leave us the list, we'll take care of it, we'll deal with it. And in a situation like that, the FDA will uh, do a follow-up inspection typically probably about a year or so later, resources mm -hmm. permitting. Six One year or so. It's variable. It depends on how many other problems are calling for their attention. It depends on the nature of the violations that need to be corrected. If, if, it's, a, if it's a structural problem, like a, a leaky roof or something like that, it takes time to fix some of these things. Sure, yeah. <laughs> The FDA gives the company a reasonable amount of time to fix 
the problems before coming back to see if they've been fixed. It's it's a good faith thing. Okay. It's not it's not the FDA coming in with a billy club and uh, a Glock and saying you do this now or bang bang you're dead. It's well, we there is there is that perception with with yeah. the raw food companies where you know they they make it seem and and I been witness to it where they make it seem as if the FDA is the bad guy and they have it out for a small company. So I just want to understand how real this is, or is it just imaginations running wild because of their own? There's there's a lot of perception issues. Okay. Um, if the just carrying on with the with the sequence, if the observations, if the problems are really egregious, or if the company is saying, well, you know, we don't think that's a problem, we're not going to do this, that, or the other, uh, the inspection at its highest level is graded official action indicated. Okay. Official action means that uh, if the company does not take care of things voluntarily. Uh, FDA will ultimately, after negotiation back and forth with the company, exchanges of correspondence over the validity of the observations, and I've seen some of those correspondences, mm -hmm. a warning letter will be issued if the company is not compliant. So the, the company has lots of opportunity to oh, actually take corrective action and make sure that the public is not impacted by the products they're putting out there. Exactly. Now, even with a warning letter, what will happen after all the give and take, the, the FDA will come through, will, um, in the warning letter, revisit all of the issues that were raised in that initial form 483, and will give the company standard uh, reply time is 15 business days in which to either make the corrections or to provide FDA with a plan to make the corrections. Mm -hmm. And even after the warning letter, there can be more give and take about how these corrections are going to be made. And ultimately, FDA will do a follow-up inspection and proceed from there. Um, so that's the basic sequence of events that follow on from an FDA's initial inspection. Does the FDA um, challenge the corrective action plans that the custom that that the that the brand puts into place? Do they? sometimes challenge that? Is that something? Yes, if they feel the corrective action plan is inadequate, they will challenge it. They will point out what the inadequacies are. Um, and uh, they won't say, you can't do that. We won't allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. They won't shut down the company. Uh, but what will happen, and this is one that happened to another of the, uh, the raw food companies, uh, not Bravo Packing, the other Bravo, Bravo LLC. Right. And what happened there was uh, Bravo LLC initially tried to take care of their pathogen problem by using uh, lactic acid. And the FDA warned them that this is not going to be effective this isn't going to take care of your salmonella problem. But they went ahead and they tried it anyway. Pathogens were still there. We went, we went through another round of inspections and correspondence and all of that. And uh, ultimately, and I think Bravo LLC, if I remember correctly, also tried bacteriophage. And that didn't work. So the company was trying different things and the FDA was cutting them slack to try and fail. Um, ultimately, the company went to the high hydrostatic pressure processing, the HPP, 
and they have not had a recall since. A lot of raw feeders and raw advocates tend to be anti-HPP. I know. And, <laughs> and um, one thing that I think about is, one, why, if it's going to help keep everyone healthy, is it really that destructive to the end product? And you know, everyone has their own opinions, but there, there are facts that are associated with this, which I know you're going to talk about. I know it's something that I want to bring up with you. Um, but my concern is, why would these companies put themselves at risk? You can't, when you look at a raw chicken, piece raw piece of chicken, it's just salmonella goes hand in hand with it. I mean, it's raw chicken, salmonella. It's impossible to have zero salmonella in chicken. Yeah. So. You're, not, you're not going to have a safe raw chicken product that's completely raw until the USDA finally decides to name salmonella as an adulterant in raw chicken. Um, interestingly, a, a slight sidelight to this, is that in Europe, um, salmonella or even listeria monocytogenes in raw poultry or any raw meat is a basis for a recall. Any? Yeah. Any? I, I monitor European recall sites for right. my food mm -hmm. alert blog. And I see uh, most recently in France, there were a series of recalls of um, raw chicken legs because of Listeria monocytogenes. There have been recalls of um, raw beef for salmonella, raw pork. Any, any pathogen in these, even in these raw products. And the reason they can do that is that the, uh, especially the Western Europeans and the UK have tighter controls on the uh, on presence of pathogens in raw meat. Tighter control than the US. Tighter control. Than the, US. the US has essentially no control because the USDA has decided that they don't want to because the industry does not want them to. Critical points right there. The industry is managing our regulatory system. That's kind of scary. To some extent. Um, I am a strong advocate. And, and again, this is a more uh, across the board topic. I am a strong advocate for getting the entire food regulatory system out of the FDA and out of the USDA. I'm with you. Doing what the Canadians have done, what the British have done, what a lot of European countries have done, what the Australians and the New Zealanders have done. And that is a single independent food safety agency. And that would be to encompass both human food and animal food. Does, do these agencies in Europe, Canada, um, anywhere other than the US, do they also oversee the safety and care of the feed animals being used for our food system? Ah, oh, that's an excellent question. I'll take Canada as an example because this mm -hmm. is where I live. Okay. Um, Canada used to have a system fairly similar to the US system. When I started working for the Canadian government back in 1972, um, Health Protection Branch, which previous to that was known as the Food and Drug Directorate, was Canada's total equivalent to the FDA. And uh, it handled the same kind of things that the FDA handled. And the Canadian uh, Department of Agriculture handled all things raw meat, raw poultry. Uh, there was a strange split on things like uh, dairy products. Uh, it, it, it was kind of a mess, but mm -hmm. it was a similar kind of mess to the FDA's mess. Okay. Uh, 
and especially with regard to the agriculture side, here you have a, a government department that on the one hand is tasked with promoting the products, promoting agricultural products, mm -hmm. and on the other hand is tasked with regulating the companies that are making those products or growing those, those feeds or uh, raising those animals, that livestock and slaughtering them. So it, it's a huge conflict of interest. Um, when I was still with the Canadian government, and this was in well, probably around 1976, 77 or thereabouts, Canada took the first attempt mm -hmm. to unify food safety into one agency. And they're actually, we were very excited in health protection branch at the time because this was something we had wanted to see. Um, and excited to the point that every, every year in Canada, as in the UK, there's the speech from the throne, which outlines the government's legislative plans for the coming year. And there was going to be a mention in the speech from the throne of this plan to unify food under a single agency. Well, it was exciting enough that the um, director of our region of our office, I was in Montreal at the time, um, literally piped the uh, radio broadcast of the speech from the throne throughout the building. And we were all <laughs> listening to it. Well, much to our dismay, that particular paragraph had been removed from the speech at the last oh. minute because the whole idea was opposed by the Minister of Agriculture, who was a very influential cabinet member because he was the government in power's sole elected member from the province of Alberta, which was the major beef producing province. So good old. What conflict? The Honorable Eugene Whalen <laughs> essentially vetoed it, and that's where it rested for a lot of years. But Canada did ultimately create um, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which consolidated um, all of the work under both the Food and Drug Act and the Health of Animals Act. In, under responsibility of the single agency. So the CFIA covers both human food, mm -hmm. and all things animal, with the exception of companion animal food. That makes no sense. The reason for that is that the Canadian Food and Drug Act only references human food. Mm -hmm. The Health of Animals Act only references livestock and poultry. Neither piece of, of, of law references companion animal food, and therefore there's no regulatory authority to regulate animal food for companion animals in Canada. Is it because... Um the industry doesn't want that regulation or is it just you know, government, government bodies and are there lobbyists kind of intertwining? I mean, I know in the U S the pet industry has, a, 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 I mean, it's a 20 some odd billion dollar industry and I'm they have lobbyists sure. leaching into AFCO and tell I don't them. think it rises to that level. No, I think it's, uh, if you like, a, a regulatory blind spot. Uh -huh. And it's just something that never got noticed and isn't, quote, important enough to get fixed. It would require another new piece of legislation or a series of amendments to one or the other of the laws. Right. And there are other priorities. There are other things that the government is doing. So what we have is a situation where there are instances, uh, for example, um, companion animal food and pet treats coming into Canada from outside the country mm -hmm. have to meet uh, certain standards. 
um, companion animal food that is manufactured in Canada for export to countries that have requirements have to be certified as meeting those requirements. But pet food manufactured in Canada for domestic distribution and consumption has no regulatory oversight at all. It's purely voluntary compliance wow. with uh, the Canadian industry group's um, adoption of AFCO standards. So, so the they're self-regulating? These companies are all self-regulating? All self-regulating. Whoa, I don't know if I would trust the Canadian in raw foods in Canada being sold in retail stores for pets. I agree. I would have a bit of discomfort there where I, they can I, I, essentially I, I, hide potential problems. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that silence just, <laughs> but it happens here in the US as well. So what the hell am I talking about? It happens even with regulation. Exactly. I was talking to um, someone who was interviewing me a couple of days ago for her uh, her food newsletter. And I, I said, I have a motto. And she said I should put it on a coffee mug. Voluntary compliance is an oxymoron. <laughs> Yes. Well, I'll tell you that the pet industry wants to deal with puppy mills so that the USDA is supposed to be overseeing. So again, regulatory, it's, it's, it's a, ah, oh, we do need to make some changes. Let's move on a little bit here. Sure. Let's move on a little bit here. <laughs> um, so actually, no, let's not move on. I, I'm curious about your thoughts uh, in chapter 10 of um, toxic, you had indicated that there had been more than five years time gap between inspections at Hills uh, Topeka facility. Mm -hmm. um, and this is relevant to the vitamin D, excess vitamin D recall. Uh, is that standard practice with government regulatory bodies or is that just because of lack of I mean, what comes, what's more important? I mean, if there's no complaints, no issues, why go check? But, and this, I assume after COVID, right? This, this all stuff, stuff all this stuff happened after COVID. So uh, the vitamin D was before COVID, if I remember correctly. That's right, 2018 it started, right? Yeah, Purina was, un unpurina started at uh, um, 2017. Got it. Uh, the pentobarbital started before COVID. Oh yeah, I remember that. Avengers uh, started right at the beginning of uh, 2017. And uh, since the Avengers pentobarbital issue, you remember that one? Yes. That was the deadly one. Mm -hmm. Avengers has not been reinspected. What? As far as I can tell, Avengers has not been reinspected since then, and I've I've double checked this with um, my media relations contacts within the Center for Veterinary Medicine, and basically what happens is that the com when the when the company has ended up complying ultimately one way or another, um, the FDA moves on to the next crisis whatever it is, there just are not enough resources for routine rapid follow-up. So whether it's a big company or a small one, uh, you tend to get often a longer lag than, than you would like to see between inspections. Now, in the case of Hills, they actually were, once they, once, once the problem hit them in the face, they actually were very good about correcting their issues. And uh, again, I saw some of the correspondence between their people and the FDA going back and forth on the corrections. And the FDA was satisfied with the steps that they had taken to uh, prevent a reoccurrence. 
And so there was no urgent need to go back and do another inspection immediately or anything like that. Um, so it, it depends a lot on uh, what the source of the problem was and what the company does to correct it and how promptly they correct it uh, and what documentation they provide to show that they've corrected it. Because as often as not, when I look at uh, warning letters, what I'll see is after the list repeating what all the problems were, uh, and after each item, the FDA warning letter will say, uh, you've told us that you've done this and this sort of thing to do the correction, but you haven't given us the documentation to back that up. Mm -hmm. proof. Or you've done this and such, but we don't think that that was enough. You really need to address it further. So there's a lot of that kind of information, even in the warning letter, that you can tell that if the FDA is not uh, satisfied with what's been done up to that point, they don't just say, these are what all the problems were. They say, here's what you're still lacking. In the case of Hills, uh, they were able to essentially sign off and say, okay, as best we can tell, you have corrected everything. In the case of Avengers, Avengers just destroyed, recalled, and ultimately eventually destroyed everything that uh, was potentially pentobarbital contaminated and presumably did whatever they needed to do to satisfy the FDA that, okay, that problem was under control. But how does the consumer trust that Avengers is not repeating the same cycle using horse meat and labeling it as beef if there's no follow through by any kind of regulatory body? How do we trust a company that did it once and has probably done it in various other ways? I mean, stealing electricity from the neighbors and you know, the family has taken over. I know names have changed, but it's still the same company. So how does the consumer trust? And my concern here, as the independent retailers go to trade shows, Super Zoo is a major trade show happening now in Vegas. And these people have these tables set up claiming amazing quality control, um, and foods that are, you know, blessed by rabbis and, you know, organic. It's just, it's an ugly scene, the pet food industry. How does the consumer and how do independent retailers who are there buying, trust what they're buying. It's tough. It's very difficult. Uh, there, there's a lot of information on the FDA site if you know where to look for it. Mm -hmm. uh, the FDA maintains a um, database of all of the inspections that it's carried out, what the outcome of the inspection was, when it was carried out, um, and this is a this is an interactive database. You can actually go to the inspection database and look for a particular company and see what's been done. If you if you know how to look for it, you have to you have to know the company's proper name and mm -hmm. if they have more than one location where where the manufacturing took place. Uh, but the information is all there. It's just not all. Um, user friendly. So you <laughs> have to do a little bit of uh, warning, investigative work. The warning letters are all online. Okay. That's all public information that is posted automatically, not necessarily immediately, but automatically. Um, so it's all there, or a lot of it is there. The inspection reports are not online. Uh, they have to be requested, they have to be FOIA'd. Mm -hmm. But okay. there's a lot of stuff that is there if you know where and how to look for it. And I will make it very easy. Anyone who has a question about a pet food company or about pet food and doesn't know how to find the information and would like me to have a quick look for them 
can send me an email and I would be happy to do that. Thank you. I, my, uh, my listeners will appreciate that. Thank you. And I'm sure you'll be getting some emails probably from me. <laughs> Find my email address on the eFood Alert site. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is a readily available address. In fact, you can email me at phyllisentis at efoodalert.com and that will find me. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll also put that on the show notes, Phyllis. Thank you. And um, I post any any pet food recalls that come up, get posted on eFood Alert. You put the your postings are from all over the US, Canada, all and over Europe. World. So all it's world. international. Uh, yeah. US, Canada, Europe. Uh, obviously not every country in Europe because I haven't found all of the <laughs> regulatory sites and they don't and not all the governments have the regulatory sites. Uh, I also uh, monitor Singapore and Hong Kong and Australia and New Zealand. Australia and New Zealand, yep, a lot of pet foods come from those countries for sure. By yeah. the way, Australia also does not regulate pet food. Yeah, I've heard, and they have regional uh, rules from one region to another. The regulation, what they claim is, I guess, regulation is different. It's so screwy. I just don't understand what we're doing here. It's a huge industry. I think what part of what's happened is that the industry mushroomed when people weren't looking <laughs> when regulators were looking and it just not everybody puts pets at the same level of importance as we do yeah i understand but the industry employs millions of people yes it does provides an incredible amount of income and taxes Yes. And revenue. I mean, it's it's a profitable industry and it needs to be regulated. Well, properly. it is an industry that impacts the health and safety of millions of animals and all of the family members who live with them. Right. And then the veterinarians that are caring for these animals are impacted as well we're taking our animals to vets nonstop and there are no appointments available these days after COVID. We need to understand the ripple effect of the actions of the whole food industry, what we're doing to our environment, to our food, our feed animals. So um, I, I wish we weren't so uh, blind sided, you know, where we just, we, we can't have tunnel vision in the way we look at how this world works and unfortunately we do so frustrating it's really frustrating and and i do believe that we're too trusting um with every food pet food manufacturer i, I just fed my cats raw chicken this morning and i was thinking i'm giving you salmonella i literally thought that and i was talking to the owner of the company who makes this food for them and they don't hpp and um, I said, I asked her, I said, if you were, if you had an FDA uh, inspector come in today and they found salmonella in your chicken, she said, salmonella and chicken go hand in hand. And we had this conversation and, and uh, I said, what would you do? Would you just dump the chicken? She said, absolutely. We test our products nonstop. I don't see salmonella in the turkey. Don't see it in the other formulas. We see it in the chicken. So here I am scooping it into the bowl for my cats. Instead of turkey, instead of chicken. They don't like turkey. I have to force it on them. So I'm like, come on. Anyway, I I digress. Um, let's uh, let's talk about um, the FDA's zero tolerance policy. I really want to understand what zero means here. Okay. when it comes to raw and is it only associated with raw food help me out here okay first of all uh it is not only associated with raw food it is associated with any food that is going to be consumed without cooking 
So that means it's associated with kibble. It, anything that is considered ready to eat, there's a zero tolerance for pathogens. So, but kibble is cooked. I mean, it's extruded. Well, there's heat process. Okay. There's a zero tolerance for pathogens there. Okay. The raw pet foods are meant to be consumed without cooking. So there is a zero tolerance for pathogens there. It doesn't matter what the uh, state of the food is. It is a question of how it is going to be fed, how it is going to be consumed. And if it's going to be consumed without further processing of any sort, without a final kill step, if you would, there is a zero tolerance. USDA justifies itself by saying, well, salmonella is in the raw meat and the raw poultry, but it's going to be cooked properly before it's consumed. Therefore, we don't have to worry about it, which is another whole story. But I'm confused. So the zero tolerance you're saying is for everything? Correct. Everything that FDA regulates. Okay. But... If it's cooked, that's a kill step. Yes. So, so if it's cooked, uh, there's also there's still the possibility, as was the case in the contaminated kibble, that salmonella contaminates the kibble after the kill step. And in the case of that contaminated kibble, what happens is the kibble goes through its extrusion and its drying, the kibble shape. And mm -hmm. the final steps before packaging are a spraying on of flavoring and all of the heat sensitive vitamins and all of that sort of stuff that gets sprayed on after the kill step. And that's where the contamination came in on the contaminated kibble. Okay, got it. So the kibble is meant to be fed, obviously, without another kill step after it. It's meant to be fed straight out of the bag. Mm -hmm. And there is a zero tolerance for salmonella or any other pathogen, theoretically, but salmonella is the one that's most likely to be found uh, on, the, uh, on the kibble. The so raw foods are meant to be fed right out of the package after thawing. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no final kill step to prevent salmonella or listeria or campylobacter, which no one ever talks about, uh, in the food as it's being consumed. So there is a zero tolerance. That's the only way to, um, to ensure or to maximize the possibility of safety. Now, having said that, zero does not mean zero. Okay, that was, <laughs> I need clarity on that because it doesn't, tell okay. me. What happens is that um, the, the FDA has a sample size that they use as a standard sample size for testing. Mm -hmm. And it might be, and this will vary depending on the nature of the product, but they work in multiples of 25 gram samples. So they might test, say, 25 grams or 125 grams or 250 grams um, or 500 grams, which is a little bit more than a pound of the finished product. And they will take it and they will test it in its entirety for salmonella. And if, it, if they find salmonella in it, that's a positive. If they don't find salmonella in it, that's as close as you're going to get to a negative, but they do not report it as a negative. They report it and strictly speaking, any presence absence test like that should be reported as not found in the number of grams because that tells the person reading the report how sensitive the test was. Okay. Okay. So uh, what is referred to casually as zero tolerance is mainly, we did not find it in this sample size. That doesn't guarantee that it's not present in the product. 
In fact, in order to find salmonella in a product, in a finished product, uh, that product has to be pretty darn contaminated. Really? Yes, yes. Think about it. Let's say you have a batch of 100 pounds of pet food, which is a really small batch. I'm thinking in terms of the small, the little guys. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have 100 pounds of pet food. Let's say that uh, you have salmonella present at what would be considered a really high level of uh, one cell per gram. Okay. That okay. one cell per gram is not going to be uniformly distributed in the 100 pounds, or it's going to be in clumps. It's going to be here and there all over the place. It could all be in one small part of the production lot that just happened to slide by a contaminated part of the processing line and pick up a smidge of salmonella and al along with some dried meat because the line wasn't cleaned properly. Right, right. Uh, if you're fine, if you're not necessarily going to find it. It might only be in 10% of the batch. It might be concentrated in 1% of the batch. So if you're taking even one pound of a hundred pound batch and testing it, you're only testing a small part of what's there. And you're not going to find it unless it's very evenly distributed. So who comes and grabs those samples? Does, does the FDA show up and take samplings or do, is the manufacturer FDA, responsible? The FDA only samples during an inspection. And even then, not always. Uh, state agencies do some retail level surveillance, some states more so than others. Colorado is one of the states that does fairly routine surveillance. Um, in fact, Colorado has its own uh, regulation on the books about zero tolerance for pathogens. Um, the legal obligation, again, as I said early on, the legal obligation is on the backs, on the shoulders of the companies to sell and to ship and sell a safe product. Mm -hmm. As part of that, the FDA mandates that they have a food safety plan in place that was prepared by somebody who is knowledgeable about food safety issues in that particular industry that they have, uh, and, and this is sometimes used almost interchangeably, a hazard, hazard analysis mm -hmm. certification that they have a, a sanitation plan in place. Um, all of these things are part of what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, ideally, those plans should include routine environmental sampling to validate their sanitation. Uh, it should include, but often does not, environmental sampling for pathogens um, because it's easier to find the problem in the environment than in the mm -hmm. finished product. It's like, easier like to on the equipment. Yeah. It's easier to prevent the problem than to find it through finished product testing. You cannot finish product test quality and safety into a product. All the finished product test does is give you a snapshot of that particular sample at that moment in time as to whether that sample is contaminated. If you find the salmonella or the listeria in that sample, you can be darn sure it's elsewhere too. That's not the only place it is. But if you don't find it and it is elsewhere because of the way the equipment, like environmental yeah, cleaning hasn't package, been done. Then it might be in the package three places over on the on the production conveyor. Right. So, so the animals are consuming this. And the humans are exposed to this yes. on the back end. Literally. How much responsibility do these companies bypass <laughs> by oh, not cleaning that button, by not uh, 
overseeing their quality control process proper. I mean, most of these problems sound like they're human errors. There are, there are, um, in the case of the vitamin D, yeah, there was a lot of human error involved. Yeah, it was all human error that could have been caught if the testing had been done as they were supposed to, based on their standard operating procedures at Science Diet. And exactly. I love that I love their ads. You know, Science did it well. <laughs> their new yeah. ads are great. Didn't do it. Did Yes, science killed all your dogs with the excess vitamin D. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of human error. There's a lot of, and again, this will vary from company to company, mm -hmm. Midwestern pet products. Oh, God, yeah. Let's talk about that. Uh, for production plants, there was that problem with the uh, aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. The uh, FDA went into the, this, this was the Chickasha, Oklahoma plant. They found all kinds of problems. They found things that made them decide we'd better look at the other facilities. They went into the other three facilities, found problems in all four locations. That was a corporate wide issue. Uh, that was a company that was not focused on safety. Yeah, they're still selling food. They, they're coming out with new lines with Earthborn nothing and and the retailers are buying it from the manufacturer and the distributors and they're selling it to the consumer what are we thinking when was the problem resolved has the fda gone back and uh, well, finalized it? there is still an open investigation a couple of years down the road uh there have been follow-up inspections there is still stuff going back and forth. I have not been able to access the final inspection reports yet because they're still open. It, it's still in progress. Sunshine Mills, still mm -hmm. open investigation, same reason. Um, and this has been going on literally for years. Right. So and these products are sitting on store shelves, are sitting in people's pantries, and are sitting in our pets' bowls. And in their stomachs. Yeah. So I think we need to, uh, as consumers, um, we need to look at the choices we're making and really think about who these companies are and not um, assume it's going to be somebody else's problem because it can impact your pets and it does. And then you get angry. Yeah, I would, I would say two things. Um, first off, uh, if you have a pet with an illness that you think might be associated to food, mm -hmm. hang on to the food, don't throw it out. Take the dog or cat or whatever the animal is to the veterinarian, try and get a diagnosis. Uh, I realize it costs a little bit of money to do the uh, the fecal sample if it, if it's a fecal problem or whatever the diagnostics are. And for gosh sakes, please let the FDA know. Because if they don't know, if they don't hear from veterinarians, encourage the veterinarian to put in a report with all the detail available contact the FDA directly mm -hmm. and there's a place on the website where you can find contact numbers for all of the FDA complaint coordinators, consumer coordinators, contact the one for your state, contact the local coordinator for your state, make the complaint, give them as much detailed information as you can. Like the lot number, UPC the brand. Lot number, the UPC, the batch, the symptoms, what tests the vet ran, what the what the results were, and encourage your vet to report it too, so that it's coming both ways. Because having the veterinary report gives it a little bit of added impetus. Got it. Um, make noise, make a lot of noise with the FDA as much as you can. Um, when the, uh, 
when the Darwin's major issue came up, and the one that I talk about in my book with that German shepherd, Blitz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I happened, I happened to connect with Blitz's owner, Judy, on, must have been on Facebook, either that or she contacted me through eFood Alert, and she agreed to share the story. When she, when I first contacted her or spoke with her, she was uh, very frustrated with with uh, Darwin's mm -hmm. because they were telling her that the product was fine. Her dog was sick, um, diarrhea. And poor dog was down to something like 60, 65 pounds and had no fat left on his bones. Right. Uh, I, I said, have you spoken to the FDA? And she said, no. I said, call them. <laughs> she called them. She gave them the information and she had lock codes. And I called my media coordinator because I knew this was a rough time. It was just before the Christmas break. And there was a, an essential services shutdown coming because of one of these budget shutdown issues. I contacted the media coordinator I was in touch with most frequently. And I said, look, there's a complaint coming in from this person about this product. Please make sure it doesn't fall through the cracks. And she reached out to the appropriate district office. Uh, they sent an inspector to pick up the samples. Mm -hmm. They covered ongoing follow-up salmonella testing on Blitz and on the finished product and were able to link the salmonella issues from Blitz to the finished product. Uh, without that kind of link up, you can't get the, the documentation that really is the foundation for regulatory action. And this company, Darwin's, is still in business, selling very inexpensive raw food um, to the consumer, direct to consumer. And there have been other reports with kittens dying. And the, and the case went on and on for years. Darwin's represents a very special problem. And it's one that, that highlights part of the limitations that the Center for Veterinary Medicine operates under and the food people too, to some extent. Mm -hmm. But the CVM, the, the, the animal food and, and animal feed arm is a, is Kind of like those nested Russian dolls. You have the FDA. Yes. You have this large drug section and a small cosmetic section. Then you have this large food section that that's smaller than the drugs that would nest within the drugs. Then you've got the CVM that's a tiny little part that nests within the food. It, it's they have a very small voice. Got it. In a sense, in terms of its budget size in terms of their resources, and in terms of regulatory follow-up. What's happened oh, yes. recently with Darwin's, uh, with this that business with the sick kittens, is that uh, the FDA went in, they inspected, they found the salmonella in the, in the uh, cat food that had been fed to the sick kittens. Uh, they said to Darwin's, this product is contaminated, please, we call it, Darwin said, no. Right. FDA said, well, if you don't recall it, we're gonna put up a public notice saying, telling consumers to avoid this because it's a hazard. Mm -hmm. Darwin's went to court. Yep. Asking for an injunction against the FDA releasing that. Of course, the FDA, while this thing was being litigated in court could not release. So there was no warning except that because the uh, court action was a public record, mm -hmm. we knew that Darwin's went to court. Right, right. So we could say that Darwin's has gone to court to prevent the FDA from giving this public notice about this product. <laughs> but these are delay tactics. Uh, Anyhow, um, the court sided with uh, with the FDA, who mm -hmm. released the public notice. Uh, 
uh, the inspection resulted in a warning letter. One of the issues raised in the warning letter is that Darwin's never registered with the FDA as a food facility as is mandatory under the Food Safety Modernization Act. They found a little loophole that says that if you are a retail establishment, like a restaurant, for example, that is selling food, packaged food or whatnot as part of being a restaurant directly to your customers, mm -hmm. you don't need to register. This is an exemption. <laughs> uh, they said that, well, because we use our own warehouse and we don't use distributors or intermediaries, we are a retail establishment, so we don't have to register, and they never registered. Now, FDA's major um, regulatory club, if you like, uh, that they can do without involving the Department of Justice is to suspend a company's registration. Okay. So that the, uh, if, they, if they feel that there's a, a safety issue that is serious enough, that is a serious health issue, they have the ability to suspend the company's registration, suspending the company's ability to produce. Well, Darwin's was producing without a registration anyway. So they can't suspend anything. There's nothing to suspend. So the only thing that the FDA would be able to do, other than going back and inspecting again, and Darwin's has already essentially said, nah, 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 we're not doing anything more. We don't think we have to. Um, the only thing the FDA can do to force compliance or to force a shutdown would be to go to the Justice Department and have them seek an injunction. Now, the Justice Department has a lot of other stuff on its plate. Yeah, exactly. There's a long list. There's a long list. And basically, they like to win their cases. Mm -hmm. So unless there's something that's really massively nasty, like the Peanut Corporation of America, yep, um, which killed people, mm -hmm. um, they the DOJ is not necessarily going to agree to take on the case. And that leaves the FDA's hands tied. But all they can do is they can keep going back and inspecting and checking when there's a problem and trying to alert the public when they can and go through another warning letter cycle. Yeah. And they reach a, a brick wall. Yeah. So the public is really ha has to take initiative and make choices using some research. They shouldn't be complacent about the way they buy foods for their pets. You love your animal. Choose your foods carefully, especially if you're going to be feeding. Well, it's, it's irrelevant. Raw, kibble, canned. We see it. Evangers, Midwestern, Science Diet, Purina. It, it, it all, it's there's problems everywhere. All over the place. Yeah, all and, over the place. And, and my, my bottom line is if you're in a position to home prepare food, mm -hmm. do so. Okay. And that's what we've done with Shalom. Can we speak about um, some of these things called, I don't even know if I should be calling them kill steps, because yeah, cooking is obviously a kill step, with the exception of the end where they're adding palatins and supplements and fats, so on and so forth. So there could be risks there. But can we talk about, tell me about HPP, irradiation, lactic acid, fermentation. Enlighten me on what these things are relevant to. I really want to know more about the raw food sector because I'm a raw feeder and a lot of my listeners and the retailers I work with have walls of freezers and freeze dried foods. So very concerned. And you know, when I look at lactic acid as being a potential option for 
I mean, if is that a true kill step? We recently had something come up with primal pet foods and their beef formulas and their response with using lactic acid. They just want you to touch on all this so the listeners can understand what we're really looking at. Okay. Um, let me touch on the last two first. Lactic acid and fermentation okay. are not kill steps. Not on their own. Uh, there was, as, as part of preparing for our conversation, I was going back into the literature a bit, and there was a rather interesting study that was being done on behalf of, uh, it was being done in, in a way of, uh, of trying to decontaminate nuts. And uh, the study looked at using lactic acid spray on its own, 2% lactic acid spray on its own, looked at using a heating step with near infrared heating as a surface decontaminant and looked at them in combination. Uh, the lactic acid on its own had almost no effect. Uh, on the on on killing salmonella, and this was what they did was they sprayed salmonella on, and let it dry, and then sprayed the products on, and looked to see how much was killed off. Lactic acid on its own did not do a lot. Okay. The infrared heating, which they looked at as a gentle alternative to a to a cooking on its own, did not do a lot. The two of them together had a synergistic effect. Okay. And brought down the counts a lot. So the lactic acid, as, a, as an individual item, uh, people think of it as, okay, it's a preservative, it's going to make things safe. A preservative is not a kill step. A preservative prevents growth. It doesn't kill necessarily. It so it's a stable. prevention step? Okay. It's a it, it, it's 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 like putting uh, it it how shall I put it? It's uh, the technical term is a bacteria stat. It stops the the bugs from growing. It keeps the population stable. It doesn't kill a lot of it off on its own. It just prevents it from growing. Okay. Is that the same thing with acetic acid? Because I've spoken to some people who use acetic acid as well. Uh, it's, it's not vinegar. Yes, acetic <laughs> acid, citric acid, lactic acid, uh, benzoic acid. They they can function as preservatives. Okay. They, they can keep things from getting worse. They don't necessarily make them better. So if your core product already has a problem, if there's already pathogens. It's meaningless. It's not going to eliminate the pathogens. Now, what fermentation does is it essentially produces lactic acid because fermentation is usually lactic acid bacteria. So they end up producing lactic acid. So that's the same situation. And in a sense, it's even less controlled because if you're using straight lactic acid, you know exactly what concentration you're putting in. If you're using a fermentation, that can vary from time to time, depending on the, the mix of your, of your microbes and what you're fermenting them with and exactly the temperature conditions and all of this. Uh, you're not necessarily going to get an identical fermentation result every time. So it's an even less controlled situation than lactic acid. Could fermentation um, cause further problems? Could it cause the, if there are pathogens in the food, could it make it worse? Uh, I don't think it would make it worse, but I certainly okay. can't see it making it any better. Got it. Okay. okay. Um, irradiation is a kill step if you use a high enough dose. Now, the problem with irradiation and one of the reasons, other, other than the fact that it is very expensive to use, uh, is that it also generates some heat. If you're 
if, if you raw foods that are irradiated aren't really raw because there's some heat added to it. Okay. There's there's some heat added to that process that's going to cause some denaturing the protein, some of the cooking, and so on. And so irradiation would be a very careful balance between over irradiating, in which case you are going to kill everything. You can kill with irradiation, or not, or doing it too gently. But consider you could conceivably use a combination of irradiation and something else, mm -hmm. like acid maybe. However, you have to, in order to, to use these things, you have to run validation studies. You have to show the FDA that this combination or this set of parameters uh, that is going to introduce something different into the food, like lactic acid, is safe and effective. And that means a lot of work going through looking at all the different conditions. Uh, you have to have the enough bacteria in there to begin with to be able to prove that it was effective. So that's irradiation. Um, my husband and I used to own and operate a company that uh, developed and manufactured rapid testing products for the food industry for bacteria, various sorts. And we used irradiation to sterilize the items that we sold that needed to be sterile. And I can tell you, when we got those cartons delivered back from the irradiation facility, um, and this could have been like an hour after they came out, they were still warm. Wow. Radiation generates heat. Got it. Yeah. So we're not really getting raw food. That's when the raw food is irradiated. You're really not getting raw. Generates heat. Keep in mind that if you've got a perishable product that you're irradiating mm -hmm. uh, and you're trying to keep that product cold, it, it can be done. I mean, you can irradiate under cold conditions, but again, the cost goes up. You right. might get some thawing of your frozen product, which is going to affect the the quality of the taste and texture. There's all sorts of issues uh, aside from the cost. Um, HPP is not a perfect answer either, because again, you have to equilibrate between enough pressure to kill the bacteria and not so much that you turn the food into a mushy mess. Uh, but again, it can be very effective. And the thing with HPP that, that you have to realize is that it's a function of how much pressure you're applying mm -hmm. relative to the resistance of the food matrix or the bug. It's like, I like to think of it as you have a, um, a grape and you have an orange. And if you apply enough pressure to the grape to squish it, that orange is, uh, that same pressure applied to the orange isn't going to affect the orange. And what you have to do is you have to find that magic equilibrating point mm -hmm. that will give enough pressure to reliably kill the microbes and not so much that it mashes the food. But it can be done and it can be done very effectively. And there are several companies now, Stella and Chewy's was the first, mm -hmm. who have implemented HPP effectively and have done so apparently with uh, reasonable customer satisfaction on the appearance of the and, and acceptability to the pets of the product. Does, that is not a cooking step. Does HPP affect the quality of the meat and the absorption or the bioavailability of the food? And I, and this is on some forums. I just read a lot of forums because I like to be informed and I'm wondering who is making what up but or what's real or what's not. But I'm curious because I, I've read that um, yeah, companies that HPP have to put vitamin packs 
in their raw foods because of the amount of pressure applied during the process. I can't see that being a problem because vitamins are not living cells. They're simply chemicals. They're complex mm -hmm. chemicals, but they're simply chemicals. And they're not going to be um, squeezed out of existence. So the nutrient profile of the raw materials aren't going to be impacted? I'm not, I'm not a nutritionist. Right. I'm not a food chemist. Um, I frankly have not looked at those studies. I have looked at studies that deal with the, uh, the visual, the mm -hmm. what's known as the organoleptic, the taste, the texture, the smell of the meat. And the reason that that can be affected is that meat tissue is composed of individual cells, muscle cells. If those cells get squashed, they're going to release their contents. And that's going to affect the, ta the taste, the texture, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But I, the only thing that I could see that would have an impact on the um, on the vitamins and whatnot is if there is heat generated during the HPP. And again, if you keep it cold, uh, then there shouldn't be an issue there. And it would be a lot easier to keep an HPP process cold than an irradiation process cold. <laughs> uh, the, the, the real resource, the real person to talk to on this is Dr. James Marsden. Okay. To state you, he was the one who set up the process with Stella and Chewy's back around, around two thousand seven, two thousand eight thereabouts. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he's still active or not. I haven't spoken to him in years. I spoke to him back then, and he he knows a lot about HPP and its application to pet food. Do you would you ever feed raw food? Um, I have fed raw food. I would never feed raw poultry. Okay. Uh, here in Canada or in the U.S., I might consider it if I was in Europe, because the level of contamination there is much lower uh, for raw poultry. Mm -hmm. When Shalom was oh, up until she was around two, three years old or so. Um, I used to feed her when we were in California. I used to be able to get, when she was a pup, these raw lamb shanks. And she loved them. But what I always did is keeping in mind that on, a, on a, uh, an intact piece of muscle meat, beef or lamb or pork, contamination is on the surface. It's not inside the intact muscle, it's surface contamination. So what I used to do is I used to take the lamb shank mm -hmm. or beef roast or whatever it was that, that I took. I, I, we would never buy it already ground. Bought a, ground, a grinder, do it myself. Right. But first I would sear the outside surfaces. Just enough to kill whatever was on the surface. And then she would either get the shank on its own and it was still totally raw inside and the bone was totally unaffected because it was protected by the meat. It was still mm -hmm. cold inside. And she loved them. Of course, when she got her permanent teeth in and her jaws were strong enough, she started splintering the bones because the lamb shank bones are not that strong. So then we went to the beef back rib bones for a while. And I continued to um, grind and give her raw ground beef as part of it. But it reached a point where she wasn't all that keen on it anymore. So we decided to switch to cooked. Mm -hmm. and now she gets cooked ground beef, which she loves. Um, I supplement with uh, liver, with egg on occasion. She gets quinoa with every meal. She gets, because she's not getting the raw bones anymore, because she was splintering even the raw back rib bones, 
she gets some um, quarter teaspoon of finely ground eggshell in each meal to ensure that she has adequate calcium in the correct balance with the other minerals because this is a natural eggshell, not a mm -hmm. natural calcium source. Right. Uh, she gets cooked chicken, she gets cooked salmon, she gets canned sardine. Uh, so she gets a variety of foods, so she gets her nutrients from she variety. Gets her nutrients from the foods. And I used the uh, USDA nutrient profile tables to make sure that she was getting adequate vitamins and minerals. Well, she it's certainly not looks good. That hard. You don't need to start adding all kinds of supplements. You don't need to stress over all of these minutia. Mm -hmm. There's actually a very good book for people who want to uh, feed a cooked diet. It's called Home Prepared Dog and Cat Diets. And I believe the author of the second edition was uh, Dr. Shank. Um, it goes through, it, it explains the nut nutritional requirements mm -hmm. for dogs and cats. Uh, it gives sample recipes that can be simply adjusted by the weight of your pet. Fabulous. About, it gives special diets for, for dogs or cats that have particular requirements, lactating dogs, puppies, senior mm -hmm. dogs with kidney problems. It's a really good book for people who want to do a home prepared cooked diet. Perfect. I will put the link to that book on the show notes, as well as the link to your books on the show notes. And I do have the, uh, the reference information to this book in my book. Okay. So it's in there. Let me ask you, what do you want your readers to take away from your books, Tainted and Toxic? Uh, be aware of all the problems, be proactive, do whatever you can yourself to minimize the risk. And that means uh, if you're talking about human food, be careful in your kitchen, treat raw foods with respect, make sure that your utensils don't carry contaminants from a raw product to something that's ready to eat. Um, I use plastic cutting boards that can go through my dishwasher. I put my kitchen sponge through the dishwasher every time I run a dishwasher load. My, uh, my uh, rag that I use to clean my countertops I decontaminate it by taking it fairly damp and running it in the microwave on high for a couple of minutes. I do that with my sponges as well, daily. Yeah, sponges too. Okay. So do whatever you can to keep your space clean and safe. Watch the recall notices. That's very important. In the U.S., those are split between FDA and USDA, depending on what the product is. Um, I cover both on eFood Alert. Subscribe to eFood Alert. You'll get the recall notices three times a week. Perfect. And you can find that simply at eFoodAlert.com. We'll take you right to the home page. Perfect. Uh, and... Ask questions if you're if you if you don't know. I delight in getting questions, whether human food or pet food. Uh, if you have a question, pop a comment on the eFood Alert site or send me an email. If it's something that uh, you think other people will be interested in, then just pop a comment. I answer the comments. If it's something that you prefer to deal with privately, send me an email. Be happy to be in touch. Phyllis, thank you so much for doing this today. You have provided a wealth of information for my listeners and um, pet lovers. I think I think you really opened up um, some pathways for uh, for people to think about. Um, my concern is that we're too trusting 
And just because a brand markets well, doesn't mean they don't have a long history of toxic behavior. And yep. um, your pet may not be their priority. Your pet is your priority. Absolutely. And make sure that you take all the steps in evaluating who you're buying your foods from, what these companies are about. And I say that for the independent retailers as well. They really need to have um, better oversight about the brands they bring into their stores. <laughs> it's just, it's a scary, scary world when it comes to food, especially pet food. Yes. And human foods. A lot of these things we've been talking about with regard to pet foods, the same issues are present in the human food sector. All you have to do is think back to a year ago and the Abbott infant formula fiasco. Mm -hmm. This is a company that typically was inspected annually. Now they missed a year because of COVID, but they were able to hide a lot from FDA inspectors. And there is no more high risk, vulnerable market to market to than infants and the other vulnerable populations who they were marketing their adult nutritional products to. But, you know, interestingly, this goes back to the melamine issue from 2007. So many babies were impacted oh, by yeah. melamine issue and the people that were involved um, I mean, weren't they put to death? The, yes. the people that were indicted, they were put to death in China. Um, That's the one good thing I can say about the Chinese, <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese uh, government. But I will also Stop say here. that the only thing that got that investigation moving was when the New Zealand partner of the Chinese company learned about the problem and put on pressure to have something done about it. Yeah, yeah. And many babies were sick and babies died because of this and it infiltrated into the pet food segment. This happens every single day. We are too trusting. We should be challenging the USDA, the FDA, every food company to provide us with their quality control data. And then make better choices for ourselves. I one one thing that I suggested and tainted when I uh, was doing the wrap up chapter in there is a lot of uh, a lot of counties and states will post restaurant grades, and a lot of states require restaurants to post their grades in their windows. I know California does. New York does as well. Yes. Um, I think it would be terrific if food companies were required either on their website or on their packaging to post the results of their most recent FDA or USDA inspection. You're opening up a can of worms there, Phyllis. <laughs> I'm good at opening up cans of worms. <laughs> well, thank you for opening up all these cans of worms. I hope all the listeners have something great to take away from this. Like don't trust your pet food manufacturers, <laughs> ask questions. And uh, if you have any questions, reach out to Phyllis Entis. I will have all her information on the show notes. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Phyllis. It was my pleasure.